The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi everyone and welcome to the A to J Author online intake series. This is Dina with the Center for Access to Justice and Technology. And before we get started today, I want to let you know that you are all on mute. If you have a question, you can go ahead and raise your hand or put your question in the question box. Also, if you're listening through your computer speakers and don't have a microphone available, you're welcome to put your questions in the question box. And I will try to get to those periodically throughout the training. Uh, additionally, you need to enter your PIN number if you are calling in for us to be able to hear you. If you're having technical difficulties like I was just having, um, hanging up and dialing back in could resolve those issues. So this is part one of um, our online intake series of which I'm going to do five parts over the year. Um, this will be the introductory session to online intake and will be a basic um, introduction to the process and addressing your concerns that you might have for your program. So here's the agenda for today. We'll start with online intake with A to J Author and what that looks like. We'll talk about the online intake process from beginning to end, the benefits of online intake for your program, the concerns that your program might have, and then briefly cover um, a little bit of the organizational process of how to get going with your online intake project and then offer you some additional resources that you can find online for your program if you're in the research phase. So we know that there are programs out there using A to J Author for online intake. Here's a list of a few that are um, currently using A to J Author um, in the process of making their online intake interview or that have projects up and running. We know that there's more programs out there and this is becoming more and more popular, which is why we have put this training series together for you. Um. Oh, thank you, Cynthia, for pointing out that you guys cannot see my screen. Like I said, I'm having some te technical difficulties today, so here we are back on um, the screen. These are some programs, as I mentioned, that we know have online intake projects started that they're working on or already have interviews up and running. Um, and as I mentioned, we know that there's lots more programs out there that are doing research to get um, their projects started. So we thought we would start with um, showing a demo of Legal Aid of Western Ohio's A to J um, online intake interview. For those of you that might not be familiar with the A to J author interface, this would be a great introduction for you to see um, what your end product could look like if you're going to implement online intake with A to J author. So this is, I was already at the Legal Aid of Western Ohio's website and I searched for a place to apply for getting legal aid and I found an online application and I clicked that button and this is the screen that I was taken to. So here you can see this is the A to J author interface. It's similar to or the same as the interface that you would have seen if you've done document assembly projects. So we'll just get started. We have a little avatar that does the introduction here and talks about their first intro screens, talk about the application itself, how to use the back button if you make mistakes, um, how you can use this My Progress bar up in the drop down menu to move back um, multiple steps if you need to. They go through some warning screens um, or more introductory screens about what the Learn More bubble does and what happens if you see one here. Um, so just getting the end user familiar with this interface and giving them some information as to how to get through this process. They also give warning information that this does not mean that you are accepted as a client for you know, their legal aid organization and talks about secure sites, just some warning information. There's people that do access these things on public computers at libraries or help stations, um, information like that before you even get started. So just giving the end user the, all the information they'll need before they get too far into the interview. So then you can see here this starts off asking for a name, um, 
just as our other guided interviews do, and that is primarily so that we can populate um, the interview with a representation of the end user. And then we can also personalize this interview as we go through. So you'll see right away that their interview asks if this end user has applied for help before. So let's say that I have applied for help for the same problem. This interview automatically tells me that I cannot use this interview and that to get information about my problem that I can call this phone number. So let's say that I've never applied for help before. We hit continue. It begins asking questions that will start to um, filter out the people who are qualified applicants from those that may not be qualified applicants. So if I am in jail or prison, um, oh, let me go back here. I say yes, you'll see that I am told that I'm sorry that I cannot get help, but that I could contact them at this address. So I'm not in jail or prison. It continues on. Now we're asking about a zip code. This is something, so say I'm applying from where I live in Chicago. This automatically tells me that this is not the appropriate place for me to be getting help. Um, so it gives me another phone line I can call, and it gives me more information and learn more here. Um, so let's go back and say that I do live in Ohio. And hopefully this is correct. Um, so now it talks about citizenship, and you'll see as we go through each of these questions, if I answer them, you know, if I said no here, then I would be redirected. Um, say yes. This talks about criminal charges. So if I say yes here, you know, this program doesn't handle those types of cases. So you can see right from the get-go that this, this application is helping end users um, get to a place where they can get information if this is not appropriate for them. They're redirected. Um, so this is a great way for the end user to access legal aid. Um, without using the phone system that you probably have set up already. So that was just what the, what applications look like for online intake using A to J Author. So let's go back. This is similar. If you've done document assembly projects using A to J Author, there are some similarities and there are some differences when you use A to J Author for online intake. So a typical document assembly project would start off with the interview, very similar to what we just saw as far as the interface is concerned. When the end user submits their answers that they have entered as they've gone down the path, um, their answers are stored in an answer file. This answer file, which is a .anx file, is then passed over to the coordinated hot docs template that you likely created that partners with the A to J guided interview. The hot docs application reads the answer file. It takes the individual pieces of information and it puts it into the correct slots throughout that entire form. Then what is given back to the end user at the end here is the completed document for them to print or they could save to their desktop if they're at home, that sort of thing. So that was a typical document assembly project. The online intake process looks a little different. We start with the same guided interview interface, which is great for those people that, you know, maybe they've done some pro se filings. This interview is the same interface, the same um, concept, it's familiar to them. So they go through, they're qualified, they input their information about their legal case, about um, their contact information, and they hit submit. The answers then, same as with document assembly, go and stored into an answer file. This, however, is where the similarities stop. This answer file is not read as it was in the previous case with document assembly by hot docs. This, we're trying to get into a, um, your case management system. So what we need to do here is all, all the case management systems have a different language that they can understand. So the answer file is organized and stored in one um, system, which is XML, and then you have a case management system that needs to read it in kind of a different format. So what we have to do is create an XSL transform, which will take the way that your answer file is stored and transform it into a file that your case management system can understand. So this is a more technical um, process that create that requires um, this XSL transform to be developed either by someone on your staff or you can outsource that. And that's something that we will address in future um, online intake trainings this year. So once your file is transformed into a language that your case management system can read, then the case, the information that the end user submitted is brought into your case management system.
The answer file data can be put into a holding area, which is what many programs like to do, outside of their case management system. So it's in a holding area, it's waiting for your intake worker to review for complex checking, um, to any review of the issue, and process as you normally would an intake at that point. So the benefits to online intake are huge. They're huge to your applicants. They can apply from any location with a computer and internet access. So they could do this from home, you know, maybe after hours at work if they're allowed to use their computers, from a library, from a local help desk. Um, so this makes it very accessible to them. They can also reach out to remotely located applicants and not have to have them travel to a legal aid organization to apply. And this is huge. I mean, I'm in Chicago. We have a great um, amount of organizations and help desks located for local people, but we're in a large state and it's not that, it doesn't take that long to get to a remotely located area where there's not such available help. Um, so. This is a huge for remotely located people and maybe some of those areas that you're trying to reach out to in your own state. So another great thing is that this is available 24-7. Someone could be, you know, working third shift and they get off and it's, you know, nothing is open. They can do this 24 hours a day from anywhere. This also has been shown for um, applicants to shorten the application time, so by 15 to 20 minutes. So if you have a phone applicant and you have your intake worker asking a question, waiting for the answer, maybe clarifying things because there's some miscommunication, things like that. So this actually shortens your application time for the applicant. It also saves time from them applying all the way through the application process at a legal aid that doesn't, um, that won't be able to help them that they're not qualified for. This also, while saving them time from applying, getting through the entire application process, you can redirect them to the appropriate type of clinic or program um, or maybe even pro se forms that you have on your website that could help this person. Another thing that has been a great benefit to applicants is that it's shown that the wait time for phone callers is actually reduced. Some people run a message on their um, on their phone line that says, you know, that if this wait time is too great, you can access our online um, intake interview and gives the address. And then people do see callers will drop off at that point after that message is played. It does reduce the time for those people that maybe don't have access to a computer um, at that time and that do need to stay on your line. So another huge benefit, lots of time savings all around. So benefits to your organizations is another huge plus to having an online intake interview. And the biggest one of all, which is why I put it in all caps, is time savings in so many ways. So right away that you saw with um, the Legal Aid of Western Ohio online intake interview, you could see that people were redirected if they didn't qualify for that organization's um, the, the qualifications that they have. So you can redirect applicants and not have to take, you know, maybe the 15 or 20 minutes that it would take of a phone call before you really were able to have your intake worker um, determine whether an applicant was qualified or not. So you're automatically redirecting those people and saving time. You're also having with um, the online intake, getting all the information from the person at once for your intake interview to review, you can identify potential issues that are highlighted for intake workers to address first. So maybe they got through the entire intake interview, but there's a few areas that might stand out to your intake worker and that they know to get to, the, to start with those when they follow up with the applicant. Um, there's also been shown to have reduced errors in data recording. Um, one of the best things is that the end user, you know, they're typing in their own name, they're typing in their own address. So there's not that communication error through the phone where your intake worker is scribing, um, you know, what the, what the end user, the applicant is saying to them. So there's reduced errors in data recording for your intake workers and your programs to deal, um, not have to deal with later. Another benefit is that a lot of programs do try to reach out to different targeted populations. Um, and maybe they're remotely located or different types of populations that you're trying to reach out to. And you can get to these people through your website, you know, with marketing and advertising in different ways that they might not otherwise um, see, maybe through your phone system and things like that. So many benefits to not only the applicants, but the organizations who take the time um, to get one of these online intake interviews up and running.
I know I've heard some concerns um, from programs who are looking into doing online intake. Um, and I've heard lots of them and I've got lots of answers for you. So I know that one of the largest concerns that I hear about is that attorneys at Legal Aid are already so overloaded, how can we possibly take more applicants? That this just sounds like you're going to, you know, have just such an increased workload um, on an already taxed system. So what we've seen from programs that have online intake interviews up and running is that it's not that the total number of applicants necessarily increases, it just changes the way that those applicants apply to your program. So there's not necessarily huge numbers of increased applicants that we've heard from programs that have these um, online inter intake interviews running. Um, online intake interviews also do redirect those applicants that don't qualify. So while you might um, see, even if you did see an increase in applicants, those applicants might be redirected. So you're already saving that 15 you know, to 20 minutes or however long it takes your intake worker on the phone or in person to find out that the applicant does not qualify. You're not having to deal with that. Um, you can also, with an online intake system, send out letters or emails um, to the applicant explaining um, why they're rejected for conflicts or um, explain to them your complaint process and other forms that might be sent to them um, to your rejected applicants, saving the staff time from having to explain these processes on the phone or in person. Um, Another concern that I hear is that, you know, with the cost that we might take to create this online intake interview, why not just hire one more employee? We could always use another employee, another attorney. Um, and the best answer that I could come up with is that this is a one-time cost that will save you for years and years to come. Um, and that actually flows into my next concern. Um, is that your program might have changing applicant requirements as you go through the years. But this online intake interview, as I said, this is going to be something that you'll have for years. And it's something that, you know, once you get your foundation down, if some of your, say, your um, financial requirements change, you know, that's just going into the software and making, a, you know, a typing change at that, at, for the amount, you know, increased amount that you now have. Um, that could take minutes, literally minutes, for someone um, to go into the A to J author software and update that program. So that's something that can easily be done. This isn't something that you would have to reinvest in over and over, you know, creating something from the beginning. Um, another concern that I've heard is that the online intake interview is less personal for um, the applicant than speaking with someone or dealing with them in person. Um, and again, with redirecting applicants with your online intake interview, you actually have staff time that can now dedicate more time to the qualified applicants and give more personal attention to those people that they are going to be able to help in the end. And that there's always personal follow-up with the applicants that do get through and that are not redirected in the beginning. This is not um, just a machine that gets processed and you know they get a letter at the end with what they're supposed to do. Usually an intake worker is always following up to review the application that they've received through this online intake system. There's also concerns that some programs have that they don't want the information that was submitted from the online intake interview to directly go into their case management system. And this is a concern that um, the programs that we all know about that have their um, online intake interviews up and running have dealt with. So many ways, many programs have dealt with it by creating a holding pen, either a separate section of their case management system where the information goes and it's not into their full case management system where only the, applica the applicants um, maybe contact and personal information is shown so that you can run a conflicts check without seeing what their legal problem was. Um, if it's a great concern, you could create a separate program outside of your case management system to act as that holding pen area. I've also spoken with other programs that have decided to do online intake, but they do it more similarly to a document assembly project where the end user would actually go through the entire interview and what they would get at the end is a completed document that they could either print or the way that most programs set it up, email to the to the legal aid organization. And then this way the legal aid organization doesn't have the information directly going into any kind of database or case management system. What they get is a PDF that is completed, a completed applicant form. 
So there's different ways that you can address that concern there. So this is a general overview of the process that it might that you might go through when implementing an online intake interview with A to J author. So the first thing is planning and preparation. And this could actually become half of your entire time that you might spend with your online intake project. The better planning and preparation you do, the easier your construction and implementation phases will be. So you'll first have this inception phase where you're meeting with your stakeholders, you're identifying who's going to be working on what parts of your project, um, you know, setting a budget, reviewing your budget, um, and then gathering information from what other programs have done, reviewing what other programs and take interviews look like, seeing if you know what they've done is something that you can replicate and how that would change you know your budget and who's on your project. Um, the next would be elaborating more, is that drafting your own online intake script for your program. Basically, your script would be exactly what you see screen by screen. How are we going to break these questions down so that they are not confusing and easily understandable by the applicant? And then this is something that you would want reviewed by everyone that you've identified as a stakeholder in this process. So that could go, that could have, um, with your intake script, there could be some time there going back and forth, making sure that everyone's on board with the order of questions, with the types of questions that you're asking. And again, doing this part of the phase will definitely save you when it comes to the construction phase. Once you're in the software, um, the A to J guided interview construction phase, there's some logic that happens there. And so if you decide later, wait, we want to completely re-ask the way or, you know, reorganize, um, it'll take longer to go back into, into the software and rearrange all of your questions. Um, not difficult by any means, but you could just save yourself some time by having that elaboration and planning phase um, be very thorough. So after you construct your guided interview, then testing and review. This, I would say, is more of an internal, you would do this internally first, so have your own organization or maybe organizations that you work with go through, review this, make sure that there's no sticking points that people aren't understanding, make sure that it's technically working correct, and things like that. You can still go back into the A to J author software and easily make changes at this point. So once you have your interview where you want it, you know all the questions that you're asking, all the data that you're collecting. Um, that's a time where you would do your transform. So this is where you would create that external transform that is going to take the answer file from the A to J author format and create, put it into a format that your case management system can read. And then again, you go through testing. So now you are at a complete process where you can test from the end user filling out the application and then the information going through this transform and getting into your case management system and making sure that everything is flowing correctly. So the last phase is implementation, training your staff to understand the process of online intake. Um, you know, maybe it's a new process that for all of your intake workers, you know, understanding when the applications come in, what the process is at that point, and then you're up and running. So. People see responses right away that we've heard once they get up and running. So it's great, it's a great um, feeling to see that this process that you've gone through um, works and that you're reaching out to people immediately once you get it online. So this is just a general overview. We will actually go into more detail um, on our next training session about more of your planning and the project management and time allocations and resource allocations on the next um, training. So some other areas that I know people ask about, but unfortunately I cannot give exact answers on, are what about time and cost? Um, and the best I can tell you is that this varies from program to program. It depends on your staffing resources. If you have someone on staff that, you know, has the time to do this, maybe you had a dedicated document assembly person, um, and, you know, this is their project for the year, and they can get going on it immediately. Um, maybe you need to outsource it, and that actually might be a quicker option for you. So there's definitely different... It just varies. It's definitely a hard thing to nail down. Um, my suggestion is that always estimate high, um, especially if you're doing this in-house and you have other projects that come up that might be more demanding at certain times. Um, you know, when you're doing that planning and implementation phase and you need to get people together to all review and agree on scripts, you know, some of those things might take longer depending on people's availability. Um, 
So, and for the cost, my answer is unfortunately the same. This absolutely varies from program to program, depending on your staffing, your need for outsourcing. Um, some of the things that I have for suggestions is that, as I've said earlier, that you start with someone else's interview. So, you know, there's programs out there that have done these. Review lots of them, see which one is most similar to what you would like, and then start with their A to J guided interview in A to J author and make the changes that you need. Um, Another thing that I've seen happen that helps with the cost and also the time is that some organizations are partnering together and they have the same case management system, therefore their transform would need to be the same. They create one general A to J guided interview that needs one um, transform and then from there, once they have that down, then they do minor customizations to their interview to meet their specific program needs. So that's another great way to pool resources among um, maybe you partner with organizations already or you have similar organizations within your state but you just deal with different legal areas, things like that. So there's definitely ways to um, address cost and time there, but I don't have exact estimates on those things for you. Um, so let's see. So that is actually my overview for online intake. Um, this is the introductory session, as I said. So hopefully those of you out there who have not had experience with A2J Author or maybe just not online intake um, have gotten a general idea of what the process would be like for your program. There are more resources that we have on our website. A to J author .org. Um, I can pull that up and show that to you. So if you go to the A to J author .org website, on the main navigation, there's an online intake page. This has resources, um, including, as you can see here, example scripts from other programs, and um, people have been very generous to share their actual online intake interviews that you can download and kind of poke around and see what the back end looks like on those interviews. We also have some recordings and slides from previous trainings that we did last year, and I will post the slides that I have today and the recording on this site as well. This e to j author website also has, if you log in, um, if you're new to e to j author and you're just looking for, let's see if that's correct, if you're looking for additional training resources, under registered users, you'll see this menu pop up once you log in. There's a trainings and presentations page. This page has all kinds of different trainings on the e to j author software itself as well as if you scroll down, um, some different presentations and things, conferences that we have done that you may have been at and want to refer back to. So um, also I know that many people do go through um, and apply for funding from LSC and they have come out with an um, online intake, some policies and things that they want to share so that you might want to access the LSC website if you are considering or maybe you have grants currently through LSC for your online intake project. Um, that website, what I did was just Google LSC um, and, I, and online intake, and this is what I found. So they have, um, from a conference that they have done a presentation on, they have their PDF about their policy requirements um, and then also their grant information from this past grant year. So that's something else for you to consider as well. So those are my additional resources. I do see that we have a question in the question box here. Um, I know someone has asked to see the programs. So let me go back here. Um, if you'd like to see the programs that we know of that are currently up and running, um, with online intake. This is that slide again. So these are the 10 programs that I know, like I said specifically, that I've actually either worked with or have spoken with um, that I know are up and running, um, either getting there and working through the process or actually are up and running. Um, so if you, maybe you know people at these organizations that you wanted to reach out to and maybe get a little more information on what, what their project was like from day to day. Um, so there's those resources for you. What else? 
Sheila has asked, is there information as to which states with online intake use which case management systems? Okay, so I know that this is a, one of the main things that you probably want to know about is we have this case management system. Who else is working with that and how did they do it? Um, I do have some information if you guys registered for this um, this training series, I did ask you, and that was one of the reasons why, which case management system that you're working with. I will share that on future um, trainings for you if that's something, or I can, Sheila, get back to you directly if you want to let me know what case management system you're working with. I can let you know if I know of any other programs working with the same case management system. Another question that we have is, um, Bob has asked, how do we know the um, appropriate number of intake assistants you're going to need to review these online applications that start coming in once you're up and running? So again, this is another one of the concerns about staffing um, that your program is probably going to have. So as I said, most of the programs that we know about that have their program up and running, um, you know, from what I've understood, that they don't necessarily need additional resources. It's just a different allocation of their time so that your online workers, um, you know, maybe they dedicate part of their time towards reviewing online applications um, for part of their day and then part of their day, you know, doing the phone or the in-person um, um, reviews and applications. Um, and so we do have people that are here if um, if you want more specific information or if you have specific questions about maybe what Ohio has seen as far as their time and their um, what they've seen from their applicants for their online intake interview. Um, if Cynthia is available, I could unmute her and she might be able to give you a little more information. Um, hi, Cynthia. Hey there. Um, so I know that this is a concern that a lot of people have regarding, you know, what is the impact on my program going to be once we get this up and running? Um, and so you have a few numbers that maybe that your programs have seen that you might be willing to share? Yeah, and, and I hear that question quite a bit too, and I understand the anxiety level that going to something like this might create. But just as um, Dina has mentioned, that... Uh, what happens is people will self-select to what they choose as their best method of access. So, for example, if people now prefer to talk to a human, they'll pick up the phone. If they hear that an online application is available during the recording while they're waiting to talk to a human on the phone, um, they will bounce out to the application. And kind of an example of that is for Legal Aid Line, which is Western Ohio, um, they went live in August of 2009, and they continue to have the same average that they had in web applications that they did before they had the A to J online intake template. So they were online intake a few years before and just an online their, within their website. They moved A to J. The applications over that number of years are still averaging about the same. They get about a third of their total intake traffic over the web. Um, they get about 700 applications per month, and you can't say, oh, it's 700 we're going to get if you're a small program. It's all relative to the size of your program. So um, they get total overall intake traffic, which is phone, uh, walk-in, and web, uh, a little over 2,000 applications a month. And they do have a swing in, in terms of how many apps they're getting. They can vary between two and 300 a month depending on the time of year. They are finding that March is their highest and December is their lowest. Um, but from a planning perspective, you could kind of see why. Spring break and holidays. Um, they also continue to see the web traffic coming primarily from rural areas. And again, if you think of Legal Aid Line, which is Legal Aid Western Ohio, you can Imagine the Ohio map, think the left side of the state. So a lot of the areas are rural. Um, but a uh, hypothesis when we first started working on this was there would be more urban, like Dayton and Toledo, which are covered by that program. Um, but there's not. So um, hopefully that kind of maybe starts to alleviate a little bit of your fears. But honestly, until you get into it and you launch it, will your fears be 
I think, completely addressed. Um, on a different note, in more of an urban, urban program, our Columbus um, program, they've been up for about a year now, and they're averaging about 240 applications a month. And they've remained pretty consistent with um, how many were, are coming in each month, web versus their phone and their walk-in. And they're at about 15% of their total applications are coming through the web. Again, that demonstrates that people will self-select as to what's the best method for them, and not everyone is going to, when they suddenly hear it on your recording, which we advocate that you do, let them know it's there. Not everyone will do that, but the ones that they're comfortable with that method will do that. I hope, does that answer the question, do you think? Yeah, I think that's a great. I think that, you know, hearing um, in, you know, especially making note that the the number of applicants that your program sees, you know, you have to take in, into consideration, um, you know, that that's not the number your program might see, but that overall what their program has seen is that the applicants don't rise. So the numbers that Cynthia was giving specifically might not be similar to your numbers. Um, so just keep that in mind and don't panic maybe if you have a smaller program that doesn't see those kind of numbers. Um, Cynthia, there was a clarifying question um, that someone wanted to know, what do you consider an application? An actual accepted client where the intake has been completed or applications that include people that are not accepted because of income or asset levels and things like that? Um. To speak to my knowledge, and I'll disclaimer that because I'm not in the programs every day, but based on what I know of the process, um, applications are total applications. Now, now, some of those will be rejected due to conflict or uh, whatever may happen, but they're still applications. Applications are just that before they become clients. So um, that's just based on what I know. I don't know if Eve's on the phone, if she has a different perspective, <laughs> I'll punt it over to her. But it's applications, not accepted clients versus um, conflict or rejected for other reasons. I will say, if I recall correctly, that the number of, I'm just seeing the data point, I believe, out of Columbus, was the number of people who were being rejected who had applied using the A to J template was the same as other methods of rejection. It was the same percentage. So it wasn't suddenly they were seeing more acceptable clients over the web. It was the same as phone or walk-in or any other method. Great. And Eve has put a comment in there that she agrees with what you're saying as well. Okay. So that's similar to what they've seen. Um, so thank you so much for sharing. Um, I know that that helps other programs try to get an estimate on the impact this is going to have on their programs once they get up and running. So thank you, Cynthia. Sure. Just one other parting word of advice. Sure. If we know that from the baseline and the history that we've had in Ohio, that if about a third of the traffic consistently over the years is from web, then programs, regardless of size, could, from a planning perspective, say, OK, let's plan for a third of our intake that we get now will come through the web. And that's what we'll manage to. That's what we'll staff to. And then we'll see and measure as you start to mature through the process. Great. There was one more question for you. Um, they're asking if you have any idea of the number of accepted clients from the applicants. So is there, do you have, maybe have a ratio or a percentage of people that you know of based on how many people apply, the percentage of people that are actually being accepted as clients? Um, I'm going to stay in the safe zone and say the majority, assuming they aren't for conflict. There's not conflict and they re get rejected out for that. Okay. Um, I don't have specific numbers for the program, but again, it would be relative. Um, but I'll say the majority of applications made, um, to my knowledge, and if they don't hit conflict and they're, they're eligible and so forth, they're going on to become clients or, and or they're referred off to an appropriate mm -hmm. um, organization when they hit the human. One of the requirements from LSC, if I recall correctly, is that a human has to determine the eligibility and they have to follow that process, and I know some LSC yes. folks are on the phone, they can correct me. They are, they are on the phone, so if they, if they say otherwise, we'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. But, um, and that's to ensure that the eligibility and the intake process is not replaced by a machine, that they have to have the human element. So um, applications who go past or get past the conflict and so forth, when they come in, in the Ohio um, process, they are 
verify the um, intake worker takes the information in, they have provided the best phone to call and the best time to call, and they're talking with that person, they talk through the rest of the issues and the, the problems of the case, and then appropriate action is taken at that point, which could be brief service, it could be mm -hmm. um, full representation, or it could be referral off to perhaps a domestic violence partner or something like right. that. So. Right. But and the long-winded that... answer is... <laughs> Sorry, sorry. <laughs> well, that's okay. That's my understanding of their, their policy as well. So Yeah. So the majority of applications coming in then go on to be handled as appropriate. Great. Thank you so much. Um, if you guys have more questions for Cynthia, I'm sure she'd be um, happy to answer those for you. I have another question that came in. Um, online intake. So Sheila was asking, does online intake necessarily include screening for financial eligibility as well? Um, and that is something, Sheila, that I do believe most programs do screen for. Um, I'm not sure. I, I know that some programs have maybe a gray area where they're, you know, they're not so drastically over the line that an intake worker wants to have more of a hands-on review of the applicant. Um, but from the from the interviews I've seen, and Cynthia, correct me if I'm wrong, if your interviews don't have financial screening, but I believe most of the ones I've seen do. Well, they collect financial information, um, things like assets, mm -hmm. uh, checking accounts, savings accounts, things like that. But that information is brought into the system, and the intake worker is going to decide what our manager is going to decide whether or not that person is eligible. Because as you all know, you know, someone could be eligible for services or, or somehow look like they're not eligible for services, but programs all have a variety of grants that could take 200% of FPL or 250 or 300%. So there's so many variables that you don't want your A to J, and you can't, again, as far as I know, have it determine eligibility, but that has to be reviewed by a human. Um, but we do collect and ask them, what are your assets? What are your liabilities? Um, what are the different categories of that? And every program varies as to how far they take that, but there's basis information. So the idea of that, again, is that data collection. You have name, address, phone number, um, what's your problem, and what are your assets. That information is populated into PICA if the case is accepted. Then the intake worker can just verify that, because people could make a mistake you know, in their mm -hmm. reporting, they may have $10 in their checking account, but they mistakenly got zero happy and added too many zeros, <laughs> and it's not correct. So that human has to say, well, you listed that you have $1,000, and they say, oh, no, no, I only have 10 That kind of stuff can be caught because that human is verifying information once um, the, uh, in our case, PICA is populated as part of the intake process. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I have some other, so thank you again, Cynthia, and if more questions come in, I will um, unmute you again. But I have a couple technical questions that I wanted to clarify from some of the questions that have come in. So let me go back to the screens where we're showing, okay, document assembly versus online intake. So one thing that I think I overlooked mentioning to you is that with a document assembly project, most programs are actually hosting their interviews, meaning their A to J guided interview and their hot docs coordinated template on the national server Law Help Interactive. So this is actually another um, large place of um, not being similar as the when you do your online intake. The document assemblies, like I said, mostly are hosted on Law Help Interactive so that when the user submits the, or when they get to your website and they access the interview, when the interview is brought up, it's being brought up from the Law Help Interactive website. The end user completes their information. The answer file is sent to the hot docs template that is hosted on Law Help Interactive. Law, the hot docs um, integrates the answers into the form and then gives them back the completed document. This is all happening on Law Help Interactive. The end user can um, then download and save or print their completed document. The other thing that has been added in the past year is that end users can actually stop part of the way through an interview, save their answers to Law Help Interactive, come back and complete the interview later. This is actually um, 
a feature for Law Help Interactive that they have set up in coordination with our software development of A to J Author. So here's where the difference happens with online intake. For online intake, most programs are hosting their online intake interviews on their own server. These online intake interviews are not being hosted on the Law Help Interactive server. So when you see this guided interview and they access it, so they're on your website and they click to apply for our online intake, um, the interview that is brought up, it does not bring up Law Help Interactive. It is on, and as you can see here, um, if we go back to uh, the um, Ohio one, you can see this interface. If you're familiar with Law Help Interactive, you know that it brings up a blue interface and then it has like the pictures across the top and it has the Law Help Interactive logo and things like that. So this is actually being hosted by Legal Aid of Western Ohio on their own server. So the end users don't actually go to Law Help Interactive as they do with a document assembly project. So if we go back to this process, um, you'll see, so for the guided interview, they access from the webs, from the server of the um, program, not Law Help Interactive. All of this happens, the answer files, the transform, all of this is hosted on um, the, the legal aid program's own server. And then the information is passed into their case management system on their server as well. So that was a difference that I, that I overlooked a little bit there. Um, another question that has come up that is technical that I want to make sure that you understand is that if you happen, maybe in the future, maybe you're starting now with one case management system and who knows what might happen in the future, or how your case management system might change, or maybe that you find another case management system is better for your program, you do not have to redo your A to J guided interview. You will, however, have to go back and redo this XSL transform. So your guided interview, which is actually where the majority of your time and work will go into developing the questions and the um, programming the logic to, you know, in, um, weed out the people that might not apply and things like that. That is not a loss. That can be reused. You would just need a new XSL transform that would take that answer file and put it into the language of your new case management system. So a couple technical things that I hope help you understand this process a little bit better. So do we have any other questions? I will scoot ahead here back to where we were with additional resources. Um, Benefits, concerns. So the additional resources. So please access anajauthor.org for anything that you might need. Um, and then, like I said, if you're an LSC um, funded program, make sure that you double check with their policies on that. Some of the things that Cynthia has mentioned as well. And then upcoming training. So if you registered for this training, it is set up as a five-part training series. You do not have to register for each part. You will automatically get a notice when the next one is coming. So the next part will be project phases and management. And I'm bringing in guest speakers, so Cynthia will come back and share her vast expertise in this area with you guys about um, project management in this area. Part three, we're going to talk about customizing, reviewing, and editing an online intake interview with the thought that you're starting with another program's interview and how to best do that and be most efficient um, starting your, pro your project that way. And then we'll talk about, you know, what happens in the future when this is up and running. Where, what are you going to do with the information and what happens after the end users that click submit and just kind of that process. Um, and hopefully we'll bring in someone from LSC to talk about some of their um, policies and things in this area. And then the last part, which is the extra fun part, all things technical, talking about that hosting that I just mentioned. Where is this interview going to live? Do you have your own um, web server to put this on and what that means and what the work goes into there um, and the transform code. So we'll go into more technical detail there. Those things generally happen at the end um, with your first part being, you know, getting that initial gathering and project management and interview development done. So I'm trying to space these out through the year. Hopefully this lines up with um, how you're working through your projects over the year. Um, and then we also have, if you're unfamiliar with A to J Author, or maybe you're a more advanced user, um, we have trainings that we do throughout the year. Every month I do a new user workshop. 
This is the first Thursday of each month, and I focus on a specific feature of the A to J Author software and go into more detail about that feature um, and do demos, and you guys are welcome to bring projects and ask questions and things like that. The Advanced User Forum meets every other month on the third Thursday, and this is more where advanced users come together and share really cool things that they have done, um, or maybe you come with something really difficult that you're trying to do and you want to get help from other advanced users. Um, great place to learn from each other and um, maybe share things that you've taken the time to develop and help save other people some time. Um, so that's what that is about. And then the online intake series will be the third Thursday of every other month. So when it's not an advanced user forum, it'll be an online intake um, training. And we will go through, as I mentioned, the five parts for the online intake series. So if you have any questions, um, we'll wrap up here. Let me double check and see. So um, the question came in to ask if there is a minimum reading level requirement to navigate the software. And I'm actually going to um, unmute you to get some clarification. David? I'm not sure. Hi. Um, so I actually was just wondering, are you asking is there a minimum reading level requirement for um, the person? I would, I would assume you're asking for the end user who's using that interview that's up and running. Right, for the applicant who's going through the interview. Right. Um, you know, what we generally talk about when creating either a document assembly project or online intake is that you, and this is part of your planning process, address your audience appropriately, especially when it comes to language. Um, I know in-house here when I work with students that we aim for a fifth grade reading level. That, um, you know, we try, it's hard, and it's especially hard when you're breaking down legal concepts um, or maybe just terminology, trying to get that, those words um, to a fifth grade reading level, but that is what we aim for um, here with our students and the projects that they work on. I believe that other programs probably set, um, you know, a level similarly that they work towards. Um, so that there might be a minimum reading level level requirement as you have asked, but I think if you go through some of these interviews and you see how broken down and that the ability that the software gives people to add additional information in the learn more bubble, um, to give definitions that pop up or to maybe redirect someone to a resource to learn more before they can answer the questions, um, I think that the, the, the level as far as the reading level is actually quite low. Um, Another thing about the software that I don't know any programs that have done this for their online intake is that we do have the ability with the A to J author software to add audio. So your end, um, the person creating the guided interview, the program, can go through and record audio clips for every screen that you would go through and even the pop-ups and things like that and actually listen to the interview as they go through it. So maybe someone who um, is visually impaired, you know, minor visual impairments, or someone who's um, reading level isn't quite there, but they can understand things verbally, that's something that they could add in. Um, it definitely takes some time with the audio, but that is a feature that we have to address those sort of needs. Great, thank you. Yep. And so, yeah, and Eve also mentioned, Eve, um, she works with the Iowa program, and she mentioned that if in your A to J author, if you're concerned, which is this is something that we do before we actually um, get into A to J author, but what's great about A to J author is that you can also create a script. So when you're in the A to J author software itself, you can create a script, and that actually would be a great way to create a script for your audio recordings if you want to just have someone sit down and read your audio straight through and then clip up for your audio recordings, but you can put that script into Microsoft Word and then run your um, your reading level diagnosis there and see what level that you're at. And as I mentioned with our student projects, that's actually something that I do. Um, we try to do before they get into the software, but it can easily be done after you're already in the software with that script creation um, service that we have with the software there. 
So are there any other questions um, for people out there? As I said, you can see here that we will go into more detail um, for each of these steps, and I hope that you all come back and join us and you know, bring your questions, or if you are in the middle of this, share with us your experience. Um, I know it's a great benefit to other programs to have that kind of personal information from program to program um, to get a better idea of what it's going to be like once you have your project up and running. So if you have any other questions, um, question box or raise your hand. Otherwise, I hope to hear from you all um, not next month, but the following month on the third Thursday. So that will be June, on the third Thursday of June. So I don't see any other questions here. If you have questions um, that I haven't gotten to today or you think of something later, you are welcome to email me. Um, and here is my contact information. So like I said, I hope to hear from you on future trainings. And don't be afraid to sign up for our other A to J author trainings as well. And I'll talk to you soon.